Hello, my name is Jeff Steinberg. Thank you for joining us for this week's edition of the LaRouche Political Action Committee Weekly Report. Today is Saturday, December 20th, 2008. We will be doing one more show before the end of the year. Joining me here in the studio again today is John Hofel, Senior Economist for Executive Intelligence Review Magazine. Uh, let's just begin, John, with the uh, rather dramatic events of the last 48 hours, where uh, there are some people involved in the uh, economic transition team of President-elect Barack Obama, uh, who uh, have basically expressed the belief that the uh, Bush White House, the uh, current leadership at the Fed, uh, are perhaps willfully sabotaging any kind of positive moves to deal with this worst in history financial meltdown. And they believe that it may very well be that the nasty uh, out the door policy by Bush and Cheney and company is not starting some new war, maybe a bombing of Iran or something like that, uh, but may involve hopelessly wrecking the US dollar and the US economy to the point that it's almost impossible for the new president to come in and get anything going because he's so overwhelmed by crisis. So yesterday, uh, we had three dramatic developments. Uh, well, one earlier in the week. Let's start with the zero interest rate policy <laughs> announced by the Fed. And then yesterday, back to back, we had President Bush announcing an absolutely insane uh, bailout, so-called, of two of the big three auto manufacturers, General Motors and Chrysler. And then just a few hours later, uh, Paulson announcing that he is going to seek an emergency release, immediate release, of the remaining $350 billion in the TARP bailout fund. So uh, some people have said, my God, you can't imagine a worse possible combination of things. Uh, since the zero interest rate announcement, I think it was Tuesday or Wednesday, the dollar has been in a free fall against the euro and against the yen. And uh, so what do you make of this picture? <laughs> the system is blowing up. These guys have no comprehension of what they're dealing with. Uh, certainly, I think the Bush administration just wants to get out of town. Mm -hmm. They're hoping that they can get out of town without the whole world blowing up uh, so that he can, Bush can deny, he can run around and say like Greenspan is doing, you know, he can go on it's not my fault tour. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's ridiculous. The zero interest rate policy is insane. I mean, they've already announced, if you look at all the various lending programs, basically unlimited amounts of money. About $8 trillion released so far. Way, way beyond the so-called $700 billion congressional cap. The big $700 billion is a drop in the bucket compared right. to what they've, either loan commitments or loan guarantees or money that they've spent well over $8 trillion, and that's going to climb dramatically. Uh, the Federal Reserve has, is, will probably, within a couple of weeks, maybe within a month, certainly, triple, having tripled the size of its balance sheet since August. Mm -hmm. uh, you have the, uh, the latest thing that the, the uh, Fed is going to do is they're going to use, their, and the Treasury, this, they're going to start bailing out the hedge funds through well, this that's new... That's the new announcement of where this final tranche of $350 billion yeah, is going to go. Through the new TALF program. Mm-hmm. You know, I think we, we should have a contest for acronyms. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so all they're doing is they're pumping money like crazy. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't work. I mean, we've already seen they promised unlimited amounts of money, and that hasn't worked. And once unlimited doesn't work, where do you go from there? You know, that their, their method is a complete failure. Now, if you look at this auto bailout, I mean, this is a joke. Because he's going to give money to Chrysler and GM. G GM to keep them going uh, until Obama takes office. Right. Okay. And then supposedly if they haven't come up with the plan and if they're not, that can prove that they're viable, then they have to give the money back. Well, they've already said that they're not going to last that long without the money. So they're going to have spent the money. 
So this is just double talk. This mm -hmm. is nonsense. You throw a little bit of money at it, you buy them off, push the problem back until Obama takes office. And then when this administration comes in, they're going to be hit with enormous problems, much worse than even what we see now. Because, you know, you're, we're now at the end of 2008. This is the year in which the system figured out that it was dead. Mm -hmm. It finally dawned, you know, the signal finally reached its tiny brain that it was dead, right. like the dinosaur. Mm -hmm. And now in 2009, they're going into a year where they know they're dead. And they're going to have to, first we're going to start off with admitting what happened in 2008 to some extent. Big losses. Very big losses from the banking system. And if they don't take those losses, if they don't publicly report those losses, that means they're so bankrupt they can't. So actually, not reporting giant losses is a worse sign than reporting the giant losses. All right, now let's just take this, this eight or so trillion dollars that's already been thrown up against the wall, which has done absolutely nothing to solve the problem. What we're really looking at is eight trillion dollars to bail out a derivatives bubble, which is ultimately what we're dealing with, mm -hmm. that is at minimum probably one to 1.4 quadrillion dollars. So this bailout course, uh, now especially saying openly, as we've exposed, you've written a half a dozen articles over the last six months saying that it's the hedge funds that are getting the bailout benefit. So. Are we going to go all the way and start, you know, hyper printing till we reach the figure of a quadrillion dollars thrown at a bunch of swindlers? Well, that's up to the new administration. Certainly, the, the Bush administration is going to keep printing money until it's out the door. All right. And then the new administration is going to have to come in to clean up this mess. Now, if they continue these policies, they're finished. They have to... They have to move to something along the lines of what Lyndon LaRouche has been discussing, or they don't have a chance in hell. Because you cannot just keep printing money without triggering hyperinflation. This idea that we're in a deflationary environment, and so therefore hyperinflation is not a problem, is just nonsense. Sure, exactly. What you're going <clears> to <throat> have, you have, there is tremendous deflation, because you have the collapse of all these fictitious assets in the bubble. But if you combine... And you've also got, at the same time, a real collapse of physical production, of physical trade globally, and so demands for things like energy are down because the world economy is really sort of grinding to a halt at the same time that you got this hyperinflationary monetary bubble. Yeah, the, the combination of the dead bubble and the dead debt machine and the attempt to bail that out by pumping all the available money in the world into the bubble to try to save it is destroying the physical economy. Right. You can see the breakdown in the supply chain already. Things haven't completely broken down, but you know it's a very tenuous process. And when you interrupt the supply from the raw materials to the finished products, from uh, the production of food to the family table, things like that, you know, when that breaks, it's very hard to put back together again. We, we, we have a specter of uh, the China situation, which uh, is merely one point of exposure to this basically collapse of the entire system of globalization that was first installed with the end of the Bretton Woods system back in 71. Uh, China uh, staked their entire economic future on export-driven economy with the United States as the primary market, Europe as the secondary market, the dry up of even just letters of credit, which are the core instruments for getting material on a ship and getting it over to a port of destination and getting payment for it, is broken down and we're getting indications of thousands of factories in China uh, being shuttered, uh, people losing their jobs, going back kind of a, a re reverse internal migration from the coastal industrial areas back to the interior, uh, a whole process that's been going on in China since about 1978, 30 years, is now unraveling in breathtaking speed. And China could basically come unglued altogether if this thing really continues much longer. 
and since we depend upon China to produce things that we no longer produce, that China is coming unglued because we're collapsing. Exactly. And, exactly. And we're collapsing in part because they're collapsing. It's a feedback. You know, it's, we're in a death spiral, and right. there's the only way to break out of this is to abandon this foolish policy and go with a global development plan. Right. Now, uh, speaking of that, um, there were reports over the last 24 hours that on Tuesday of this past week, the entire Democratic House leadership met with Hank Paulson and they had uh, a very tumultuous session. Um, a number of the Democrats were basically saying flat out to Paulson, don't you dare come back to us with demand for the additional $350 billion because you've betrayed all of the promises that something would be done about home foreclosures. Clearly, Congress is feeling an enormous amount of heat from the population, from their constituents, who are being destroyed going into this new year's. And um, reports from that meeting indicated that Barney Frank got up and openly admitted that all of the legislation, particularly the so-called bailout of the uh, housing bubble that was passed through Congress in July of this year, did absolutely nothing to solve any of the massive home foreclosures. Now, uh, I had a discussion with Lyndon LaRouche yesterday going through some of these reports of these, you know, meetings where members of Congress literally stood up in tears over what they're hearing from their constituents back home. And what LaRouche said is, look, uh, in August, September of 2007, I said exactly what has to be done. I laid out in the Homeowners and Bank Protection Act how to prevent any additional foreclosures and how to put the federal and state chartered banks, the commercial banks, the savings institutions through an orderly bankruptcy reorganization. And in fact, the very people who are now pretending to defend against a continuation of this process by saying they're gonna put all sorts of conditionalities on the next $350 billion of the bailout are the very people typified by Barney Frank in the House, Nancy Pelosi in the House, Chris Dodd in the Senate, who basically said at all costs back in the fall of 2007, we're gonna stop LaRouche's Homeowners and Bank Protection Act from being passed through Congress. We're not gonna do it. We're gonna come up with any lame excuse we can, any alternative, because we're being told by our friends in the hedge funds and our friends on Wall Street that this kind of bankruptcy reorganization is unacceptable. So basically everything that's happened, go back to 2005 when LaRouche said exactly what needed to be done to save what was still at that point a last dying breath of an auto sector. September 2007 with the HBPA. Uh, do you see any indication that these people in Congress have learned any lessons from this and that we're going to see anything different coming out of them? I think that, first of all, I don't buy that they were fooled. Oh, I don't think they were fooled in the least. They yeah. were told by I mean, no, I'm not Soros, saying... Rowlett, and company. No, I'm saying when they say, but when they say they were fooled, let's get real, they're cowards. Yeah. The fact is that this whole operation, the bailout operation, has always been about protecting the banking system, protecting the financial markets, protecting the values of paper. At the expense of 300 million Americans. That you're throwing the, the homeowners, the idea that you're going to protect property values, you know, what you're doing is you're protecting the debt. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. You don't care about the homeowners. If you cared about the homeowners, you would shut the system down write these houses down to reasonable levels, reorganize the system, and take care of the people. It's always about the money every time. Mm -hmm. and, and we said it. At the time, we said it. This was no secret. Right. And so, you know, if they really want to change, they've got to look at themselves. They've got to look in the mirror, and they've got to find the guts to stand up to this system and call it what it is. And... I think some of them are beginning to feel the heat and are beginning to come around. 
you know, we should take Nancy Pelosi and put her in a wax museum. But I don't think you may have to polish her up a little bit, but I think she's ready to go right in. Yeah. <laughs> That's you a very, know. I feel sorry for the others in the wax museum. But, well, you know, uh, it's very interesting because you have this song and dance routine yesterday. There are clearly members of Congress, both Democrats and Republicans, who are going to introduce legislation to ban the further release of that last $350 billion. Uh, Imhoff is, is one, I believe, who's already made it clear. Uh, so then you get Barney Frank and Chris Dodd coming in and saying, we're going to draft legislation to authorize the release of the $350 billion because it needs to be done on an emergency basis. But we're going to be the ones to introduce some measures of protection for homeowners and things like that. It's a sick joke. Now, the worst aspect of it in one respect is that Barney Frank yesterday on Friday said, uh, I'm going to make sure that before any of this money is released, there's an agreement reached between the Bush White House, the congressional leadership, and the president-elect. So in effect, President-elect Obama had better watch his back because some of the people who are trying to do the bidding of the hedge funds and this whole Anglo-Dutch financial system that's dead are Democrats. And so, you know, we're, I think looking at a situation where the fault lines are not along partisan tracks at all, but the fault lines are, as you just said, John, who's going to put the banks and the bailout first? And who's going to put the interests of the American people first? So this is an issue in which we're about to go into a great sorting out process. Now, uh, we picked up, again, over the last several days, discussions with some very senior people in Europe, here in the United States, and in Russia. A common view that the bottom is going to fall out starting January 2nd that once we go into the new calendar year with business plans and projections for what things are going to look like for the next year, uh, we're about to see a massive process of further erosion of what's left of the industrial economy of the planet. And so this idea that January 2nd, one person up in New York described it, January 2nd begins the year of the bloodbath on Wall Street. Yes. I mean, as if 2008 wasn't. Yeah, well. But, you know, you're going to have, but yeah, it's going to get worse. It's going to be much worse. You're going to have huge layoffs because the only way a lot of these companies are going to survive the year, I mean, w in the context of which they approach these things, is cutbacks, severe cutbacks. You know, Chrysler has already said it's closing, it's shutting down operations for a while. It may never reopen. Right. You know, we don't know. Uh, the retail sector, after this Christmas, there's going to be a lot of bankruptcies in the retail sector. When the retail sector collapses, that triggers the collapse of all the malls that have been built across the country. Sure. You're going to see a bloodbath in commercial real estate. Yep. That this whole thing is just snowballing, and it's going to get worse, worse, worse. And whatever they want to talk about, about this next $350 billion, well, the $700 billion was never a serious figure. They're going to have to start authorizing incredible amounts of money, an open-ended bailout, or they're going to have to take a different approach. Yep. Well, you know, speaking of a different approach, um, midweek last week, uh, Lyndon and Helga LaRouche were in Strasbourg, France, where you have the uh, European Parliament. Uh, they were there at the invitation of uh, a group of Italian representatives uh, Mr. LaRouche gave a very, very well-attended press conference, uh, answered quite a lot of questions, and got some very prominent coverage in the Italian media. And basically what he laid out is that uh, we've reached the end of the line. The system died 18 months ago when he called it in July of 2007, and that there are really only two options on the table. Option one is that Mr. LaRouche and his close friends and collaborators succeed in putting together a four powers cooperation. United States, Russia, China, and India. Certainly we expect the vast majority of nations around the globe to join in that, but we need an initial core of powerful countries 
who are prepared to put this entire system through a bankruptcy reorganization and to basically restructure a new financial system modeled on the old Bretton Woods arrangement, a fixed exchange rate, but to actually establish what Franklin Roosevelt initially intended but never got to fully see through due to his unfortunate and very untimely de death in, 18, uh, in, in April of 1945, namely the establishment by treaty agreement of a global credit system oriented towards economic development. And what, La what LaRouche laid out is exactly how he would go about establishing such a system under today's circumstances and what it means in terms of the destruction and defeat of the Anglo-Dutch liberal system of globalization, free trade, and Malthusianism. And what LaRouche warned is that if that plan A is not implemented in the very near future, then plan B is a world of horrors in which nations as individual nations or clusters of nations within geographic regions are going to scramble to minimize the destruction under conditions of a new dark age that will make the events of the 14th century in Europe look like nothing in comparison because we've got six and a half billion people on this planet and if we start to see the kind of accelerated breakdown this year of the bloodbath then um, Humanity is going to be at risk for generations. We'll probably see the population of the globe through regional manipulated wars, through disease, through famine, fall to somewhere around one to two billion. That is a holocaust on the grandest scale in the history of mankind. But now, at the same time, what we're seeing is a dramatic increase in the uh, credibility and the significance of Lyndon LaRouche's role all around the globe. We talked last week, I was with Mr. LaRouche and Mrs. LaRouche in New Delhi, India for about a week or so of very intensive non-stop meetings and discussions on this four powers issue. And uh, so we are really entering into a kind of a new phase of this fight. How do you see the situation both here in the U.S. and around the world in terms of Lyndon LaRouche's growing influence and importance as the idea man behind this alternative. Well, as you said, there are really only two plans on the table. And everybody around the world who's serious, the governments all around the world are looking at Lyndon and they realize that he's got the only plan that will work. The real question is, do they have the guts to go along with it? And then you have this, this financial bailout policy saving the system. You know, the Anglo-Dutch system has died. The only way it can survive is if the rest of the nation, if the nations of the world commit suicide right. in order to bail out the Anglo-Dutch system. Mm -hmm. And so they're demanding that the nations commit suicide. And people realize this. So I think that the, the question, is, the influence of Lynn has never been higher. Right. That every government in the world who's serious is looking at him and studying what he does. That, that every move is watched. You know, people are looking at our website because they, they know we're the only ones with answers. The question is, are we going to be able to pull together the political coalition? Will they move? Not do they know what needs to be done, but will they have the guts to do it? Mm -hmm. And I think that's the fight. Right. And, you know, it's a, it's a very important uh, moment. And I, I think it's noteworthy that uh, in his recent travels, first in New Delhi, India, and then in Strasbourg just this past week, uh, Mr. LaRouche is constantly being asked for his appraisal of the incoming Obama administration. Uh, many people know that uh, Mr. LaRouche was rather critical of the Obama campaign, uh, during the primaries especially. But uh, what he's pointed out is that uh, what we see, number one, is that the selection of people to fill some of the most important cabinet slots, especially those dealing with national security and foreign policy, 
uh, are about the best choices that probably could have been made. And so on the one hand, we have a better than expected combination of people coming together if we get between now to January 20th without some catastrophic event that throws everything off whack. Uh, so we have, on the one hand, a far better combination of people coming in prepared to govern under circumstances of the worst crisis in history, certainly modern history. And then secondly, the point, the deeper point that Mr. LaRouche has been emphasizing is that under our constitutional system, our presidential system, the institution of the presidency is something with greater responsibility and something much bigger than simply the man or woman who's been elected to serve in the Oval Office. And so on some critical occasions in the history of our country when we've been really on the verge of collapse, it's been the moves from people within this broader institution of the presidency that's taken perhaps a highly qualified person or in some cases someone below qualification and turn them into either good or great presidents. So we have a situation right now here in the United States, certainly in comparison to anything that we've seen for the last eight years with this horror show of Bush and Cheney. Uh, we have a real shot here in the United States of the presidency reasserting itself in a way that responds to the absolute demands of the American people and people around the world to do something fundamental to solve this crisis. So uh, we're going into a period uh, today, by at least calendar date, we are one month away from the January 20th, 2009 inauguration of President Obama. And within this period of time, there's going to be an enormous amount of diversion. We have the Christmas and New Year's period. Uh, and then we've got the beginning of the new calendar year and what kind of immediate economic and financial horrors we'll be facing then. But during this period, we have resolved to further upgrade the LaRouche Political Action Committee website. Uh, we're going to be vastly expanding in the immediate days ahead. One of the critical aspects of that website, which is LPAC TV. Every day, you're going to be able to go to the LaRouche PAC website, and you are going to see two or three video news features, in addition to the written material, press statements by Mr. LaRouche, other written breaking news items. But we're going to be going to a live news and news analysis format to where the most critical events of the day, whether they occur in Washington or Moscow or Beijing or London, uh, they will be reported in real time. And that will be supplemented every week by some longer feature material. The fight between the American system and this Anglo-Dutch liberal imperial system has reached a point where it's no longer possible for those two opposing systems to coexist. So that's the fundamental issue on the table. And I urge all of you who have not already become addicted to this to go to the LaRouche Pack website two, three, four times a day you're going to urgently need it because basically we're going into a period of the next two or three weeks, which is going to be, for all intents and purposes, a, a news blackout. You can buy the newspapers to look for the S after Christmas super cheapo ads and sales things. And uh, you can, you know, turn on for the entertainment on CNN and things like that. But you're not going to get any kind of real news of the kind that EIR and the LaRouche Political Action Committee is working on round the clock. So I want to urge you all to get used to the idea that you can't just visit the LaRouche Political Action Committee uh, website once a day or once a week or once every few weeks. You've got to get there every day two, three times because we're in that kind of period where moment to moment 
we don't know and we can't fully anticipate in these near-term situations what's going to break and you've got to have that at your fingertips because to make these institutions of government function we are going to have to have an educated and mobilized citizenry cutting through the fog of the holidays and being attentive to the fact that we are living through the most dangerous times in modern history. Now, before we sign off for the day today, John, I just can't resist asking you to give us your take on uh, probably the biggest financial scam since Ponzi and maybe way beyond that. Uh, so give us your take on the, uh, well, you pronounce the name. <laughs> Bernard Madoff. Madoff with all Ma our money. Madoff. Right? Yeah. Well, it's an enormous scam. This guy was ex very big, you know, $50 billion, they're saying. Now, there's enormous amounts of reporting on this. You know, his client list included some of the most powerful institutions in the world. And he said, according to, he told the prosecutors he was running a giant Ponzi scheme and that he lost maybe $50 billion. Now, I'm highly skeptical of the official version. I suspect that what's going on, while I don't know what's going on, I think that there's something, that there's a cover-up underway, something much bigger, that there are indications that, uh, that this might be connected to the crackdown on the Swiss bank accounts and things mm -hmm. like that, that some of this money may have been moved elsewhere to hide it, that... Uh, also that he was protected by the SEC. They had the opportunity, they supposedly even investigated him to see if he was running a Ponzi scheme and he came up clean. So there's a, there's a much bigger operation here being covered up. And so we've been looking at it quite carefully to see if we can actually figure out what it is. And if we do, we'll certainly let people know. Uh, but in the meantime, this is a very juicy and very interesting thing. I mean, this guy made off was in many respects at the level of a Soros or a Julian Robertson as a money manager mm -hmm. early on. He was a creation, obviously a creation of these British networks. And these British networks, the Soros, the Robertson, other things, these are dope money and petrodollar recyclers used you know, to fund financial warfare. So uh, this is juicy, but don't believe what you read in the press because there's a giant cover-up. Yep. Well, we will get back to that in subsequent shows. Uh, in the meantime, though, since you did mention George Soros, I can't resist uh, closing out on one final uh, development of the week. Um, of course, we reported last week about our own uh, on-the-ground investigation in India uh, of the uh, assault uh, on the uh, resort hotels and some other locations in Mumbai that took place November 26th through 29th. We now have a very valuable intervention on the part of the Russian government in the form of statements that were issued earlier this week by the uh, head of the Russian anti-narcotics uh, police, a man named uh, Viktor Ivanov who, based on the Russian-Indian collaboration in investigating this crime, uh, have concluded that what we're looking at is a case of narco-terrorism, that the uh, apparatus that carried out the attacks uh, was largely financed through the heroin trade coming out of Afghanistan. Uh, the Russian official specifically mentioned Dawood Ibrahim by name. He is an organized crime figure now based in Karachi, Pakistan, but still runs the underworld in Mumbai. And it was some of his people who provided critical uh, support for the highly trained, really Delta Force or Navy SEAL quality trained team of uh, suicide commandos that carried that attack out. So we have a spotlight, once again, as the result of this Mumbai incident, on the British dope ink structure. And so the fact that you've got the United States, Russia, China, India, each in their own way collaborating against this British dope ink apparatus is of extreme significance. And this kind of action 
could very well represent a critical flank in the emergence of precisely the four powers cooperation that Lyndon LaRouche has been touring the world organizing to put together. So, of course, when you talk about Britain's Dope Inc. in the current context, more than anything else, you're talking about the person of George Soros. George Soros is not himself necessarily the top dog kingpin, but Soros has been put forward by the British oligarchy, by the British Foreign Office, as the world's leading spokesman for the legalization of this entire global dope ink apparatus. And as such, Soros bears a direct responsibility for the events in Mumbai, and virtually every time you get an incident of narco-terrorism or asymmetric warfare on a larger scale, coming out of the financing from these dope operations. Have a picture in your mind of George Soros. It's not just the fact that as a teenager, he proudly worked for Adolf Hitler and that genocide machine. He brags about it to this day. But then having, based on those qualifications, been picked up by British intelligence, he has become the living embodiment, the personification, if you will, of this continuing dope ink apparatus, which of course represents, at this point, probably a multi-trillion dollar component of this entire offshore dirty money uh, apparatus. Precisely the last remaining bubble after the collapse of the global real estate bubble is the dope bubble. And so the Exposure and destruction of George Soros represents perhaps one of the most important steps to be taken to pave the way for this four powers cooperation, to bring about the kind of new system so that we can get down to the serious work of rebuilding the physical economy of the world. So, John, thanks again. Sure. Uh, it's been another week, another very monumental week. I don't know if you had a final... I'd just like to say, you know, the thought of keeping a picture of George Soros in your head is kind of disturbing. But if you imagine it behind a set of bars, it's easier to live with. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I, think, I think we could all enjoy that greatly. Mr. LaRouche does not support capital punishment, but he does support the idea that there are certain people who, by virtue of their bestial behavior, belong in a zoo somewhere. So again, my name is Jeff Steinberg, this is John Hofel, and we want to thank you for joining us for another edition of the LaRouche Political Action Committee Weekly Report. Today again is Saturday, uh, December 20th, 2008. We'll be back again next week and then look forward to you continuing to join us during the next year of 2009. It will be one way or the other a monumental year in world history.